thankful uh, for the firing line. That's where we need to be, and uh, good to be in the Lord's house. I see a lot of empty pews this morning. I guess folks or some are still traveling, but we're glad to see you here. You glad to be here? Say amen. amen. We're thankful for the privilege and the honor to be in the Lord's house, and uh, we, sh we could be homesick. I've experienced that. Some of you have too, and uh, there's nothing like being able to go to church. I thank amen. God. And uh, if a lot of folks are able and they don't choose to come, one day they'll want to come and won't be able to. So take every advantage you can of being in the house of God, being in your place, uh, worshiping the Lord. Amen. Uh, and uh, thank God for church. And you, you are visiting today. You're an honored guest. We do appreciate your, your presence. And you that are watching live stream, thank you for watching. And if you are in the area and you are physically able to go to church, we'd love to see you right here in the Sanctuary of Bible Baptist Church. And we're thankful that you're watching today. We're going to get right into the service, and uh, we're going to pray. Of course, uh, no better way to open the service up than to, than to pray. And uh, so we have much to pray for, and do continue to pray for the many that are sick in body in our church family. Good to see Miss Nancy Pruitt. She came in. She's been in the hospital this week. Pray for her. Miss Judy Kirkman's done had two surgeries since Friday in the hospital, so remember her. Lord, touch her, help her. She's not eat or drink anything really since about Thursday. They're not letting her do that yet, so keep praying for her. And then I also want to remember the families that have lost loved ones, the Buckner family, Brother Jacobs, that's attended here many, many, many times. Uh, he went home to be with the Lord, so remember that. And also I'll go ahead and say there, the, the funeral service will be tomorrow afternoon at Stony Mountain Baptist Church over toward Hendersonville, and uh, the service will be at 2 o'clock. So if you're able to be a part of that, please do. Also, church will be uh, serving them a meal. Uh, so if you can have, uh, and, and of course, Brother Bud and Miss Trish are going to take it to them there at Stony Mountain. So if you can have food here. Brother Bud, you say about 1 o'clock? About 1 o'clock, please. We need your help. So if you could help us out with that, have food here at the church at 1 o'clock. We'd appreciate that very much. Uh, but continue to pray for all these folks. Miss Donna Townsend, Miss Joe Carty. Good to see Miss Joe this morning. Uh, J.C. Deal, Linda Short has surgery Wednesday, so let's remember her. I also want to pray for the Rollins family. My good friend Donald Rollins that visits comes here a lot. He passed away Thursday. Uh, he requested no services. So y'all pray for his family, his mother and brother Paul, uh, that God would help them. Also the Cook family. Some of y'all may know Emma Jean Cook. She passed away as well. I'll have her funeral in the morning and then at 11, and then we'll go over and be a part of the other funeral there. So we desire your prayers on that. And uh, Gerald Moore, good to see Brother Gerald this morning, Earl Gosnell, Liam Blackwell, Kathy Kerr, Vivian Howard, Francis McSwain, Francis Pruitt, Jane Gowan, Tasha Pruitt, uh, also uh, Evelyn Jones, also her husband, keep praying for them. And little Landon, keep remembering him. Uh, Tony and Brian Ballou are sick today, remember them. Uh, David and Kay Eubanks. Also the folks in Kentucky, those floods, that's the area uh, that uh, Brother David goes to. And actually him and Brother John will be leaving after the service, going to Kentucky today to take a, a load of stuff. So pray for them and pray for those folks. I've seen some of those pictures of that flood, and it's just sad. 
And so remember them, remember those folks there. Uh, Cindy Elder, uh, Tim Jett, pray for Brother Tim. Uh, there, the cancer is in that one spot, but the tumor is the size of a cantaloupe. And uh, they'll be removing that coming up in a few weeks. So be, be much in prayer for him. He'll be traveling back to the Mayo Clinic for that. Uh, Martha Struby has more surgery coming up. Remember her, Glenn Corn, uh, Jeanette Phillips, and her mother, Patsy Hayes, uh, Larry Martha Phillips, uh, Lynn Fowler's mother, Rand Sandra Robinson, Ben Carty, Miss Cindy Hunt, sick today. She asked us to pray for her. And I'm sure I may have missed some if you have an unspoken. All right, let's pray this morning. Father, we do love you, and we're so thankful for Jesus. We're thankful for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from sin, and we do plead that precious blood on the services today and all the requests that, Lord, has been brought. And, Lord, spoken and unspoken, Father, you know every need. And, Father, how we need revival. And, Lord, we know revival, Lord, it's, it's not manufactured by man, but it has to be sent from you. But, Lord, we can prepare our hearts for it, and we can, we can seek your face and turn from our wicked ways and humble ourselves and pray. And, Father, Lord, you, you will hear from heaven. And I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would bring us together in one mind, one accord. The power of God be in the midst, Father. Father, in the flesh dwells no good thing. So we pray we enable us to worship you in the spirit and the truth. Lord, touch every need. Save that nearest hell today, Father. And, Lord, just have mercy on the service. And we'll give you thanksgiving for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Quickly, by announcements, again, revival actually starts, the revival meeting starts tonight at 6 o'clock. Brother Larry Raines will be here. Of course, Brother Doug, Brother Doug's sister and family, they'll be here to sing for us as well. Brother Doug and them have an earlier service, so they're able to get down here at 6 o'clock. So uh, we're looking forward to that. Of course, tomorrow night, uh, Brother Barry Rackley will be here Tuesday night. Brother Barry Rackley and Wednesday night, Brother Bill Pickle will be here. So be much in prayer for revival. Be here. Be in your place. Be a part of that, okay? So remember that. And then, of course, uh, again, we're serving the Buckner Jacobs family a meal. So please have food here tomorrow by 1 o'clock. And then uh, safety team, you'll have a meeting September 7th. A tenth be breakfast at seven, and, and the meeting at eight o'clock. Teen, young adults, they'll be a lock in for you on uh, for ages thirteen and up. August the twelfth, and uh, of course, uh, in the thirteenth. So please sign up if you have any questions. You see, Brother Andrew McMakin. Also, the thirteenth, I believe it is, that Gateway Baptist Church is having a youth meeting. Brother Carr will be there to preach for them. So be a part of that if you'd like to be. I believe it's at six o'clock. So that's the thirteenth. So remember that. Don't forget uh, youth devotions at five. 30, prayer rooms at 545 church at 6 o'clock tonight. Amen. Let's all stand. Ushers, you're coming. We're going to receive our morning tithes and offerings. You give that which belongs to God. The tithe is the Lord's. Amen. Honor the Lord with what He is today. Amen. All right. All right. Brother Carl. Brother Father, we thank the Lord for another up here back in your house this morning. Father, thank you for being so good to us and all you made a blessing, Lord. We Pray, Lord, for all these prayer requests and mention each one to stand need up, Father. I just pray you go by and look, touch them all the way you can, Father. I pray, Lord, for this offering. Pray you bless it. Bless those that have it. Those not have it, Father. Spread your work here. Being our pastor, we use this mighty special way this, not, this morning, Father. Speak to them what you have to hear. And by coming lost, we pray, Lord, you touch them before they leave this church house. In Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, take a red church and we'll turn to page 157. 157, trust and obey. First, second, last. Y'all help us sing. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. For while we do His good will, He abides with us. Can abide while we trust and 
prayerfully.
together while the choir comes down. Uh, let's have a time of fellowship, church. Let your neighbor know you're glad to see him in the house of God this morning. God walks the dark hills, the ways, the byways. He walks through the billows of life's troubled sea. He walks through the cold, dark night, shadows of midnight. God walks the dark hills just to guide you and me. God walks the dark hills to guide my footsteps. He walks everywhere by night and by day. In the silence on down the highway God walks the dark hills just to show me the way God walks in the storm, the rain and sunshine, he walks on the billows through glimmering lights. He walks up the mountain high, cross rivers through valleys. God walks the dark hills Cause he loves you and me God walks the dark hills To guide my footsteps He walks everywhere By night and by day in the silence on down the highway God walks the dark hills just to show me the way He walks in the silence on down the highway God walks the dark hills just to show me the way.
waters, storms raging high. The waters around them, they were troubled that night. Fear filled their hearts, they felt they would die. They failed to remember that the Master was nigh. Then He spoke the words, and the winds all stood still. You see, even the waters, they obeyed His will. Now He calmed their storm, just like He will mine. If I just remember, He lives deep inside. So why should I worry? Why should I fear when the very same Jesus he is always so near? He lives in my heart and he hears when I cry. I'll call on his name till the storm passes by. We read in the Bible when he walks with him. Brought light to the darkness when the way grew so dim. How great it would be to have his footsteps in mine and walk with the master all of the time. And when trials come and death seems so nigh, I'll call on the master. I know he'll get there on time and when sickness comes and my body's in pain all I have to do is call on his name so why should I worry why should I fear when the very same Jesus he is always so near he lives in heart and he hears when I cry I'll call on his name till the storm passes by we read in the Bible when he walked with him brought light to the darkness when the way grew so dim how great it would be to have his footsteps in mine and walk with the master all of the time and when trials come and death seems so nigh i'll call on the master i know he'll get there on time and when sickness comes and my body's in pain all i have to do is call so why should I worry? Why should I fear when the very same Jesus he is always so near? He lives in my heart and he hears when I cry. I'll call on his name till the storm passes by. Why should I 
fear when the very same Jesus is always so near. He lives in my heart and he hears when I cry. I'll call on his name till the storm passes by. So why should I worry? Why should I fear when the very same Jesus he is always so near? He lives in my heart and he hears when I cry. I'll call on his name till the storm passes by. They brought the blind to Jesus' side. Touch me now, I pray. So Jesus led him down out of town, touched his eyes that day. He said, I see men as trees walking. So Jesus touched him once again. And his blinded eyes received their sight. When Jesus passes by Oh, it always makes a difference When Jesus passes by The devil trembles, the enemy flees When Jesus comes on the scene He always shines a ray of light the darkening clouds must fly. It always makes a difference when Jesus passes by. They took him to the tomb that day. Lazarus was his name His loved ones wept For death had crept Into their lives with pain Oh, but someone sent a message And soon Jesus did reply And even death could have no power When Jesus passes by Oh, it always makes a difference when Jesus passes by. The devil trembles, the enemy flees when Jesus comes on the scene. He always shines a ray of light. The darkening clouds must fly. It always makes a difference when Jesus passes by It always makes a difference When Jesus passes by Y'all enjoy the good singing? Amen. Amen, what a truth Amen, I'm glad Jesus will never leave us nor forsake us And I'm thankful He's still passing by He'll still help you, help you today. I don't know what you need, maybe, but everybody here's got one today. Uh, you didn't come in here without some type of a need. 
uh, some type of, you say, preacher, I don't need any food, I don't need any clothes, I don't need any shelter, God's providing, thank God. But spiritually, we all have a need. Amen. Amen. Physically, most of us have a need. Right. Amen. Emotionally, we, a lot of us have a need. Financially, a lot of us have a need. God's able to meet our needs. Uh, amen. He said, but my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Not according to the bank. Amen. Uh, not according to uh, the government, uh, but according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Uh, so whatever your need is, it's coming from His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You can't beat that. Whatever the need is, he's got riches of grace. He's got riches of mercy. He has riches of goodness. He has riches and riches. Amen. Amen. Our Father owns the cattle of a thousand hills. As the old preacher said, he owns the taters on too. Amen. It's all his. Praise the Lord. Uh, Joshua, the book of Joshua, please. Uh, I feel led of God to go this route this morning. If God will help me. Joshua chapter number 5, Joshua chapter number 5, uh, we know that uh, Joshua has been called to uh, lead the children of Israel after the death of Moses, and uh, Joshua was a great picture of the Lord Jesus, Joshua was a great leader, uh, Joshua made a great leader because he first made a great follower. Uh, Joshua made a good second, uh, first man because he first made a good second man. Anybody that can't, can't uh, take orders is not going to be able to give them either. Amen. Amen. Uh, so thank God for Joshua. And God chose him out. He was faithful in his life. He was faithful. Uh, even trusted God, him and Caleb. Uh, and they were the, really the only two that got to go over into the promised land. Uh, the rest of that crowd died in the wilderness, wandering around, complaining criticizing, come on, uh, folks, can you? Can I say those chronic complainers and criticizers, uh, that's where you're going to stay, in the wilderness, wandering around all your life, failing to enter into, into the promised land and enjoying the blessings of the Lord. Amen. Uh, I, I, I don't want to be one of them. I want to live in Canaan's land. Uh, see, Canaan's land, we know, is not a picture of heaven. It's a picture of the victorious Christian life. And of course, to get to the victorious Christian life, an obstacle had to get out of their way, and that was the wall of Jericho. Now, we understand the text. Israel's about to overtake Jericho, but first, the wall had to fall. And folks, there's some things that God wants you to accomplish, but first, some walls have to fall. Amen. First, some things and some obstacles it's got to get out of your life. And that's what we want to preach on, our battle with life's strongholds. I'm glad the Word of God is, 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 is mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. And folks, the devil will try to bind you with strongholds, but you don't have to allow that. In Joshua 5, look at verse number 13 with me, please. Joshua chapter 5, look at verse number 13. We're going to read a few verses, and I'm picking up here and there, but I know you're familiar with the text. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as a captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. 
Thus shalt thou do six days. And seven priests shall bear uh, before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day you shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass when uh, that when they sh- uh, make a long blast with the ram's horns, when you sh- when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat. And the people shall ascend up every man straightway uh, before him. Now go down to verse number 20. I'm just cutting through here. So the people shouted with the pre, uh, uh, when the priests blew the trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. Amen. So that the people went up into the city, every man straight uh, before him, and they took the city, and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and ass with the edge of the sword. Uh, A lot of people don't like that word, utterly destroyed. Uh, Did you see here that they utterly destroyed every breathing individual outside of Rahab and her family. Little babies, too. A lot of people say, preacher, that's, that's cruel of God to do that. That's bigger than us. But however, God knew the heart of people, and God knows the heart of man even before man's formed. And he knew if they didn't utterly destroy them, they'd be a thorn in their flesh forever. If you don't believe me, ask the Amalekites uh, who they did not. So therefore, we understand that uh, God had a divine plan of destruction in order for them to have true And full victory, this had to happen. Now, let's talk about Jericho a moment. Jericho, as we know, was a great walled city. History tells us that it was surrounded by two massive stone walls. The outer wall was six feet thick and 20 feet high. The inner wall was 12 feet thick and 30 feet wide. There was a 15-foot guarded walkway between the two walls. Now imagine that, especially you that were in the military because this was a military strategic thing. It was a wall (coughs) of protection. I meant to do that. And by the way, the enemies could not get in without a divine hand from God. Now Israel was their enemies. They could not within themselves tear it down. So from a military standpoint, it was practically impenetrable. They didn't have the bombs that we have today that could easily go through something like that. But however, they had it fixed where those inside would not be affected by those outside. Hello. However, but for Israel, needing to get past that to have full victory, God had to intervene. So the day that great wall could stand as an obstacle that was between Israel, the people of Israel, the people of God, and them claiming and having all that God had promised was theirs. See, they they weren't just fighting for it. It was already theirs. See, there's some things, folks, that the devil has blinded us 
and has set walls before us that is hindering us from having what's already ours. It's already been promised. Amen. So, before we go any deeper, and before they could go any deeper into the land of Canaan, the wall of Jericho had to fall. Now think about that practically for us as God's people. Uh, For us today, this wall represents those things that are standing between us and going any farther with God. They could be standing between us and God and hindering revival. We all have them. We all have something that is constantly jumping between us or jumping between your positive progress with God. God wants us to have positive progress. It could be anything. It could be anybody. The devil's a liar. He has children that are liars. And their, their whole, whole cause of life is to build walls and make us think we cannot get beyond them. Their constant thing is to say, this is as far with God as you can go. This is as much peace and happiness and joy as you can have. This is the wall. This is God. You can't go any farther. And a lot of times we just stay content or we just accept that and realize other people have more joy, more effectiveness, more happiness, more zeal than we do because they don't have the walls we have. Yep, they have walls, but by the grace of God, God helped them drop them. And so you and I today, uh, we got to realize we got walls. The devil makes sure he's going to put something to try to put something between us and victory, us and peace, us and power, us and revival. The key to this thing is, do we want those walls to fall? Or are we just going to live like that and just walk around and wonder what's beyond it? Wonder what we could be if that wall wasn't there. Wonder how much joy we could have but that wall. Whether it be a person, place, or thing, or a mindset. See, the devil plants walls in our mind that's not even real. Hello? Now, there's some real walls. Jericho, the wall of Jericho, was a real wall. But sometimes uh, we run from enemies, we run from things that's in our mind and we make them true. The devil plants the seed and builds the scenario and the next thing we know, that wall is a real wall in our mind. Satan battles our mind. I've told y'all this little story many times, but it shows you the picture of how powerful your mind can be to influence. Like the fellow that ran out of gas. He got his gas jug and the store was several miles away. And the whole time he's saying in his mind, he's even talking to himself that the store will be closed when I get there. The store will be closed and I won't be able to get any gas. He kept telling himself that what he was doing. He was building a wall in his mind. When he got there, the store was open, and he done got his mind in such a tease, he walked in and said, I don't want your gas anyway, and walked back to his car. You said, that man's crazy. Folks, think about it. How many times have we, we may not have done that, and that's extreme, but however, we've built walls in our mind. Things, are, they, they're not even real, but the devil makes them real. And we don't, and we don't, uh, we don't bring our thoughts and imaginations under subjection to the scriptures. See, a lot of times when you have crazy thoughts, uh, hey, bring them in contact with the word. A lot of times, the word of God will smash a wall in your mind. Amen. Prayer and the spirit of God and the word of God is good at breaking down walls. So this morning, if 
y'all give me a few more minutes, I want to notice that. I don't know about you, but I want walls removed so I can have revival. And in order to do that, some things have to be involved. Notice the text. Let me give you a few of them. The first thing that has to be before the walls fall, there must be confrontation. I said that right. Everybody awake? Okay. There must be confrontation. I believe many of God's people are stuck right here. They can't go any farther because they will not confront. Now, preacher, what are you talking about? Joshua was confronted. Before anything happened, Joshua, he got confronted. Notice in the text, in chapter number 5, Joshua was confronted with three things. Number one, he was confronted with the person of God. In in verse 13 of chapter 5, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand and Joshua went before him and said Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said Nay, but as a captain of the host of the Lord now I come. Joshua got confronted with the person of God. That's a picture of salvation. Who was Joshua talking to? An angel? I believe he was talking to Jesus. That was Christ that met him there. That's Jesus. Hey, Christ came to where he was. Christ stood there and was the difference maker. See, uh, the person of God represents salvation. See, before he could get victory, he had to have a relationship with the Lord. And right there, we see a relationship starting. We see, we see a, a picture of the new birth. See, many folks say, preacher, I can't get victory. I can't get victory. Maybe you need to get saved. I'm not trying to discourage you or confuse you, but folks, uh, you may just need Jesus. Before Joshua could fight the foe of Jericho, he first was confronted by the Lord Jesus Christ. Before God can use your life and bring true peace and victory, you must be confronted with Jesus. My question is, do you remember the day you looked and there he was? I'm talking about with the eye of faith and spiritually. The day that you came in contact with Christ and you and Christ done business with just you and Him alone. I remember the blessed day that Jesus stood in my way. Whoop! And the day He introduced Himself to me And the day I got born again, hey, there was a confrontation. Has there ever been a confrontation of salvation in your life? This was was a real confrontation. This was a real meeting. It was a real conversation. It was a real event. Salvation is real, buddy. Meeting Christ is real, and it is a necessity to go any farther in your life. You cannot have peace until you know the Prince of Peace. You cannot pray until you know the one you're praying to. Amen. Amen. Not just know about him, but get to know him. Do you know him? Was there a day you was introduced and you received him as your Savior? The person of God. He was confronted with the person of God. And there we see salvation. Notice next, he was also confronted with the position of God. There we see sanctification. What did did the, the Lord answer him? He said, nay, but as a captain of the host of the Lord. 
You know what Joshua said? Hey, you know what Joshua said? What he heard? I am in charge. You are under my authority, Joshua. In that we see sanctification. In that we even see submission. There Joshua dedicated his life all over again to the Lord. Not to Moses. Not to the people of Israel. But now comes separation and sanctification and being set apart to the host, to the captain of the host, the Lord Jesus Christ. There was sanctification. There was submission in his life. A lot of people, and remember I told you, this point right here, many people don't get any farther because if they are saved, they're not sanctified. What I'm, I know positionally they are, but I'm talking about practically. They're not submitted to God. Therefore, they do their own things and come up dry, come up empty, come up aggravated, come up angry. No joy. Folks, I've preached to quiet churches before. This ain't the first one. That's right. And so we see Joshua could not have went any farther until he was confronted with the person of God in salvation and the position of God in sanctification. Right there, Joshua submitted his whole life. This battle is the Lord's and it's for him. My life is here because of him and to bring honor to him. And he separated himself to God. You want a waterfall... You better remember your position and remember his. Amen. You're not in charge. You're not the boss. Now there's some people, Christians, they ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. There's nobody going to tell. going to change my mind. There's nobody, nobody. You're in a bad way. Amen. You're going to wander around and die in the wilderness. What you're going to do? Because guess what? You're saved. You're not fully satisfied in the world. And then you ain't right with God in obedience. You ain't fully satisfied in His camp either. You're miserable. You're miserable because you're always, you're always in a defensive mode. And you're always offended. Why? 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 You're always thinking somebody's out to get you. Why? Because your life is not in submission. Amen. 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 Somebody asked me about my life. They just want to know something so they can tear me down. Not everybody's that way, Hoss. Some people actually love you. Your pastor does. Amen. Your Sunday school teacher does. Your youth leader does. Amen. People you go to church with love you. So we had, it was a confrontation. I'm trying to hurry. It was a confrontation of the person of God, the position of God, and the power of God. We see not only Joshua's salvation, his sanctification, and his submission, but his surrender. There, right there, as the, Lord, as the Lord has given him orders down in chapter 6, he surrendered to God's plan. Joshua had never fought a battle just like that before. He's fought battles, but he's never fought like that. March around the wall. March around the wall again. March around the wall again. Six times in six days. And on the seventh day, we're going to go around it seven times. And the priests are going to go before you with the ark. They're going to have trumpets. And they're going to blow the trumpets and shout. We're all going to shout. The wall's going to fall flat. And then you can go in and take control. What? His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. But you know what Joshua did? So be it, Lord. That's what I'll do. There had to be some confrontation. Where has confrontation come up in your life? You've been confronted by the person of God. Are you saved? You've been confronted by the position of God. Have you, been, have you really set your life apart? Have you been confronted by the power of God? Surrendered to His way. His word tells us his way. If you walk in contrary to his word and his way, you can't live in Jericho. If you confronted your way of thinking, have you confronted your rebellion and disobedience? Have you brought yourself in submission to the authority and the lordship of the Lord Jesus? Have you been confronted? Secondly, and I don't know how much farther I'll go, but secondly, 
we see confrontation had to be involved. Then we, we see confidence had to be involved. Not self-confidence, but Joshua had to have confidence in God's promises. Well, Lord, I don't understand it. It makes no sense to me, but you said you don't do it, so you know what? You're going to do it. God's promises. God promised. God guaranteed victory. But the only way God guarantees victory is we do it the way He says do it. Preacher, I'm always defeated. I'm never happy. I'm never satisfied. Do it the way He said do it. Half coming to church, half praying, half tithing, half being a witness, half submitting the, the authority God's put in your life, half do hey, 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 living in the carnality in the flesh will not get you in the Jericho. Amen. Won't get you in the Canaan's land. You got to do it God's way. In God, he had confidence in God's promise, he had confidence in God's plan, he had confidence in God's power. I wrote this down. I think this might be the second time I've used this. Maybe. I can't remember. But I wrote this down a long time ago. Talking about confidence in Him. They didn't... Now listen to this. This is going to help you. You might want to write this down. They didn't have to be consumed with the trying, but with the trusting. See, when you get consumed... Now, we have to put forth our efforts. We have responsibility. There is the responsibility of the believer. Don't get me wrong. But when we stay so consumed with, I've got to do, I've got to do, it becomes pride. It becomes you putting all the work on you, and you'll be defeated. The consuming should come in by us, us being consumed by trusting what God said. You do it my way, I'm dropping a wall. You do it my way, that's the land of Canaan. You do it my way, the enemy's going to fight. Come. You just keep doing it my way. We're trusting in what he said. We're consumed with what he promised. We got it backward. We're so consumed with the trying, we fail to trust what he's already said. See, Israel, they, they've been in battles. They've never seen nothing like this. But God made them a promise. God had a plan. And they knew God's power. And they didn't stay consumed with the trying. They stay consumed with the trusting. And see, the problem with that crowd that died in the wilderness, they stay consumed in the trying. We can't. They're bigger. They're this. They're that. They're the other. And they died out there. I'm talking about in wicked mess. But this crowd here now, buddy, they're consumed with trusting. We're going we're gonna to trust God and do it His way. We're going to trust God and watch Him do a work through us. That's how you get to Jericho. Thirdly, I'm hurrying. It involved confrontation. It involved, it involved confidence. It's going to have to involve conviction or conquest. And I'm not going to take time to read verses 6 through verse 21. But those verses there tell me this. They tell the great story of Israel's victory over Jericho. Here's what they had. They had determination. They had to be determined to obey and do it God's way. I'm a poet and didn't know it. No doubt they, the temptation was there to do like they'd always done it. Folks. You keep doing what you've always done, you're going to get what you've always got. Amen. There's some things we don't change on because we know it's what God said and it works, it works, it works. But I'm talking about you, you, you personally. You keep trying to get victory the same old ways you've always tried to get victory and you're going to get defeat every time. Just do it God's way. Be determined. God said this, that's what I'm doing. Amen. By the grace of God, got to have some determination. Got to have some dedication. Get this. Israel walked around the wall six days. What happened? Nothing. They walked around the wall six times on the seventh day. What happened? Nothing. 
I mean, you know, people are people, and it's not recorded, so I need to be quiet. But he had to run through about 50,000 of them people's minds like, what are we doing? I mean, we, we look like a bunch of idiots. These people are looking over at the wall and say, what are they doing? We're just walking, getting our exercise. We, uh, that whole host, those men, they walked around it for one day. See y'all tomorrow. I mean, I miss one. Second day comes. Have a good day. Six days. But you know, his commandments are not grievous. Was that hard? God's way is too hard. No man's way is too hard. <laughs> you may be thinking it's hard because you have to trust and obey, but God's commandments are not grievous. I mean, come on, man. That's rough. God's asking too much of me. Really? To walk in a circle? And do it once a day for six days and do it seven times on the seventh day? It's, I, I, really? See, that's our problem. We think we know better than God. You say, well, God, God, did God have to do all of that? Did that I mean, that don't make any, quit worrying about the sense it's making. Come on. Quit, quit worrying about trying to figure God out. Some of these things just simply put because I want you to and I'm going to prove your obedience to me. Amen. Will you at least walk in a circle today? Amen. Will you walk in a circle tomorrow? The next day, the next day, the next day, the, just walk in a circle, go back to camp, eat your bite, go to sleep. On the seventh day, it's going to be a longer day. I mean, it took some determination. It took some dedication. On the seventh day, on the seventh go-round, the trumpets blew, the people shouted, and the walls fell flat. Now, I know some of you are going, but preacher, God is God. He could have snapped his fingers and that just been a little bit of sand around that thing. And everybody in Jericho would have dropped dead. But what would the people have learned? They learned to obey God. And they learned the dividends of it. And they learned obeying God will drop a wall. And defeat an enemy. Hey, church. What, what, what's the wall before you? Is it a person? Is it a thing? Is it a habit? Is it a place? It's, what, what is it? You're not going to drop a wall. Hey, let me tell you something. Laying out of Sunday school, laying out of worship, laying out on Wednesday night, that's not going to help you drop no walls. Come on. Well, we feel that that's your problem. Quit feeling and start obeying. I can imagine that whole crowd probably didn't feel like that was how to defeat an army. But it was beside, what they felt didn't matter. What we feel don't matter when it comes to obeying the Scriptures. I don't feel right about that. I don't feel, my family don't feel that. Quit worrying about that. What God say? Good for you. Can y'all tell I've heard that till I'm up to here with it? <laughs> I have, man. Man, I miss you at church, miss you at Sunday school, miss you. When we feel, here we go, what did I ask? Why don't you just do what God said? Amen. Set your feelings aside. God knows how you feel. God loves you. Amen. He's not trying to hurt you. But he'll make you feel a whole lot better about things if you just obey him first. Right. 
see, see, get this. The shouting didn't make the walls fall. Get a hold of this. The whole point of them shouting before the wall fell flat was this. They praised God for victory by faith before the walls fell. They sure did. I mean, they shouted, they praising, then the wall falls. Are you getting it? Well, I'm going to shout as soon as God does this wall moving stuff. I'm going to shout. I'm going to, I'm going to praise Jesus as soon as. Now, won't you go ahead and praise Him now? Amen. See, God's ready to knock a wall down, but He wants you to praise Him by faith first. He wants you to be faithful first. Thank you. Thank you all, four people, for that. Makes me feel a whole lot better about what I said. But now here comes the getter, and I'm done. It involved conviction or conquest, determination, dedication, but then it involved death. See, after the walls fell, the Israelites went into Jericho and killed everything that was living except Rahab and her family. They had orders to do that. Why? Because if they hadn't have... It wouldn't be long and walls would have been built back. Are you listening to me? I know that, that sounds pretty extreme, but God knows. Can I say something to you? If you don't completely kill that pet sin, stop making provisions for it, that wall is never going to fall. If it falls for a moment, it'll get built back up. You can't, you can't have temporary victory and still leave it having breath. I'm preaching to me now. Preaching to us now. I, it's just preaching. Hey, I'm talking to the preacher. As much as I'm talking to you. You've got to completely kill those things. You got, and I'm not talking about going out and killing a person. You don't understand what I'm saying. But I'm talking about, hey, you may have to kill that relationship completely. Some folks have got a person in their life that completely dictates their life. You, you've got to kill that. So, some of you, are, are, if you are so consumed with pleasing the Lord and Lord loving you and liking you and using you as you was an individual, a certain individual, man, you would really, you'd, really be in, you'd really be in the promised land living high. Stop chasing. I preach Wednesday night on, on rejection. Stop chasing people that don't want you or, or don't want what's best for you or just dragging you along to get what they can get out of you. They, they ain't doing nothing. That's just a wall. That's just a wall. Folks, I hate to tell you, in real life, there's givers and there's takers. I got a call. I got a call. As a matter of fact, I got 50 calls. I don't know how many calls it was. And he called me back a while ago. This guy said, look, I need some coffee. I need a Diet Coke. I need creamer. I need this. And then I said, okay. I don't know him. I, I thought I said, this is Bible Baptist Church, not by low. But anyway, <laughs> he said... I mean, he just he told me where he lived, and that's okay. I see what I can do. And for a command, he called back and said, "Oh, I forgot. If you can bribe, if if you bring this and this, I'm telling you, hey, it's real life." I said, uh, "Okay, preacher, what are you gonna do? I don't know. Because you, I'm afraid. I mean, if I if I feel that order and take it, what's what's next order? Right. You know, that's right. you got to use some discernment." But this dude, just like, man, you're the preacher. You owe this to me. I know you don't know me, and you don't know anything about me, but here's my grocery list, Hoss, and I want you to pick that up for me and bring it down here. Y'all, it'd blow your mind the phone calls I get. So I, my wife says, honey, you at the place now you need to write a book. I said, they wouldn't nobody believe it. I said, wouldn't nobody believe it. If I wrote a book, ain't nobody going to believe that. I said, I said, all the ones that believe that is other pastors. 
I said, church members ain't going to believe that. They ain't going to believe you do that behind the scenes and, and, and listen, hear that and deal with that. They ain't going to believe that. They're going to say, that's all made up. We ain't buying that book. I'd have to give them away. Then they people throw them in the trash. Lying preacher wrote a 200-page book, all kind of stuff he made up in his mind that happened in the ministry. No, it's real. There are going to be people in your life, they ain't come to, they ain't, hey, we all need help every now and then. That's why, hey, I love helping people that need help. Amen. But not takers. Amen. 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 Girl went to school with years ago. She's, she's moved and need groceries for her new house 15 times. And guess who, guess who she has to get them for? Takers. Takers. Well abled, healthy individual. They're takers. Some of you ain't liking this, I can tell by the face, but that's reality. And you know what? You let that kind of stuff consume your life and be a wall in your life. Hey, there's some people that don't like you, never like you. It doesn't matter. Hey, it don't matter if you get up every morning, go to their house and kiss their big toe, they ain't gonna like you. You're gonna worry about it. You're going to worry about if they like you or not. You're going to worry about if they're going to talk about you or not. Hey, let it go. Let that wall fall. Because there's all kinds of people that love you for you. They see, they see your faults. They see your frailties, and they love you. There's people that see my faults and my frailties, and they love me. Amen. You got to let them walls fall. If it's a sin that you keep going back to, you better pray every day, God, give me victory to keep that. I want that dead. I want that dead. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but it's Christ that liveth in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who gave himself for me. We better remember, until we have a real crucified life, we'll never live in the promised land. They were determined, they were dedicated, and they put to death what God said put to death in their life. Victory. It equals victory. Let's all stand. Miss Lisa's coming. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. No one's looking on but me and the Lord. The altar is open. Folks are coming. I need to pray myself. Heads are bowed, knives are closed. No one's looking on at me and the Lord. These folks are coming. Before I pray, maybe you're here today and you say, Preacher, Preacher, I'm here, but the first thought about confrontation, Preacher, is... It's me. I've never been saved. I've made professions. I've repeated prayers, but the Spirit of God's touching me and nudging me and showing me my need for Christ. Preacher, would you pray for me? While nobody can see you but me and the Lord, would you slip your hand up? I'll say thank you. You put your hand right back down. Are they one quickly? Preacher, would you pray for me? I'm not sure that I'm saved. Let me ask you this question. Could you give an answer of the hope that lies within you right now if you were called on to give a testimony of your salvation? I'm talking about biblically. Could you? If I pointed at you, you, you know, just say that we was doing that, and I pointed at you and said, give me your testimony. Could you, could you rise from your seat and boldly give a biblical testimony that you know without a shadow of a doubt you're going to heaven because you've done it God's way. If you can't do that, can I pray for you and I get along with God? I'm not going to treat you funny. I'm not going to talk about you outside of the Lord. Preacher, that's me. I need prayer. I'm not sure about my soul. Anybody? You hear today, so preacher, I know I've been saved, but my life has not been surrendered, submitted to Christ. 
separated unto him. And preacher, I can see now where, why my walls won't fall. Preacher, would you pray for me? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you. Anybody else? Preacher, would you pray for me? God bless you. While folks are praying, you can look this way.